God's people said, amen. amen, amen. Great to be in the house of the Lord this morning. So today we are studying the day after Jesus' crucifixion. It's Saturday, the 15th of Nisan. As we saw this last week, Friday was filled with more major and memorable events than any other day out of the Passion Week. It was a day that brought betrayal, denial, courts, accusations, earthquakes, tombs opening, dead people coming back to life, Jesus' crucifixion, as well as the body of Jesus being laid in a borrowed tomb. The action was nonstop. Saturday is exactly the opposite of that. In fact, everything that is contained in the gospel narrative about Saturday can be summarized in just a couple of maybe statements, a couple of sentences. For example, Mark gave us four words for Saturday. He said, when Sabbath was over. That's all he gave. Luke gave 10 words. He says, and on the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. John, he said nothing about the Sabbath at all. In fact, he goes directly from the crucifixion to the resurrection. And then you have Matthew. He, he gives a very brief paragraph, but the focus of this paragraph is pretty much focused on the religious crowd and a concern that they had. So overall, the events of Saturday, it's very minimal within the gospel record, but that does not mean that nothing was happening. In fact, there were so many things happening behind the scenes that it's going to take two different Sundays for us to work through the events of one Saturday. So we got a lot to cover, but to kind of give you an overview of how this is going to be broken down, the first half of this message, you're going to hear me talk a whole lot about perspective. The second half of the message, we're going to be talking more about preparation. So here's what I mean about the first part of that. I'm going to share the story of Saturday from three different perspectives. You're going to hear the perspective of the religious crowd that cried out, crucify him. What were they doing the day after Jesus was crucified? You can also hear the perspective of Jesus. We understand that his body died physically on the cross, but his spirit is very much alive. So we understand, according to Scripture, that his spirit is alive. So where was his spirit? What was he doing? What was happening on the other side of a sealed tomb? If you've never heard, you're going to hear it this morning. And then also, you're going to hear the perspective of the 11 remaining disciples. And here's why that's important. What do you do the day after your world falls apart? We have a lot that we're covering this morning. Now, this might sound like pastor hype at the very beginning of a message, and it might be, probably is. But I'm just telling you, if you are already a follower of Jesus Christ, there are going to be more insights that are helpful and timely and practical that we cover this morning than probably on any other day in this study. There is a lot to work through. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will dig into the events of Saturday. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we ask that your spirit guide us into truth. May we not miss a piece of what's going on. Lord, may all the connections, all the verses, all of the pieces come together, and Lord, may it bring clarity to the hearts of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you'll notice in your sermon outline sheet, once again, there's no fill in the blanks. There's a lot of statements on there. Uh, those are there so that you don't feel the need to miss something, but at the same time, write down things that might be important along the way. So we're going to begin today with the perspective of the religious crowd. And there's a statement that's in your notes. It simply says, the tomb was secured by the chief priest and Pharisees. So Matthew gives a very short scene that took place on the day after what's referred to as the preparation. Uh, in Jewish life, the hours from 3 to 6 p.m. on Friday, just before, Pass or just before Sabbath, was considered to be the eve or the preparation. It was a time to prepare for what's about to take place on Sabbath. So some groups would take longer than others, but primarily from 3 to 6 p.m. Now, anything that happens at 6 p.m. beyond is now considered to be a part of the next day. So in this particular scene, 
the chief priest and the Pharisees, they remembered something that Jesus said before he died on the cross. They remembered that he said he was going to die, and three days later he was going to rise again. Now, they're not concerned that he's going to physically rise from the dead, but they were concerned that some of Jesus' disciples might come in the middle of the night and steal the body away. And if they were to do that, it would start a rumor that he has risen from the dead. So if immortality is ever attributed to a prophet, a great teacher, or a self-proclaimed Messiah, it would create upheaval for months, if not years, in the future. To prevent that from happening, they go back before Pilate. And they asked Pilate to secure the tomb. He says, secure it as best you possibly can. So they secured the tomb. They placed a seal on the stone. They left a guard there right in front of the grave. From their perspective, the job is now done. Jesus is dead. Another radical has been silenced. And life could very quickly go back to normal. Saturday for the religious crowd was a day of enjoying what they considered to be immediate victory as well as tying up some loose ends. So now let's switch to the perspective of Jesus. You have a statement in your notes that says, Jesus descended to Hades and preached to the captives. And there's a number of references that go along with this. This one's going to take a little bit more time for us to unpack. Jesus' body died physically on the cross. We understand that. But his spirit was very much alive. So what took place on the other side of the sealed tomb? Well, a part of the answer actually comes back to a conversation that Jesus had with one of the thieves that was crucified with him. There on the cross, if you remember, there's a thief on each side. One remained militant and hateful all the way through the end of his death, but the other one was repentant. And that particular thief said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me, when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus' reply was, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. He gave a location and he gave a timeline. Location is paradise. Timeline is today. So hold that thought in your mind and let's add together a few more passages. What happened to Jesus' spirit after his body died? It's been suggested by some that he entered into what's referred to as soul sleep. Others have said he went back to the Father. Still others have said he descended into the corridors of hell and he experienced torment for those following three days. But did you know we don't have to speculate as to where he was? The Bible very clearly tells us. In fact, according to Jesus' own words, the testimony of Ephesians 4, the story of Acts chapter 2, And the teachings found in 1 Peter chapter 3, Jesus descended to the place of the dead and he preached to the captives. Now, I'm going to connect this back to the word paradise in just a moment, but just hold that thought and we're going to add another piece in. When Peter preached his famous message on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, he described the fact that Jesus rose again from the dead. And in that moment of his message, he's actually quoting King David from Psalm chapter 16, verse 10, when David said, you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Now, Scripture clearly tells us in that text that he's not going to abandon his soul to Hades. That's found in Acts chapter 2. That's in Greek. But the quote is actually coming from Psalm chapter 16. That's in Hebrew. And the word that you find there is the word Sheol. It's the same exact idea. It's just two different words describing the same place. So the term, it describes the place of the departed dead. It describes the grave. It describes hell. Now, in the New Testament, Hades is very clearly defined as a temporary place that had two different components. There was a place for the righteous, that was a place of blessing, and there's a place for the wicked, that is a place of torment. The ancient pagans, they described Hades as having Elysium on one side and Tartarus on the other side. The Jews defined it as being divided into two parts. There's Abraham's bosom, also referred to as paradise. You get the connection? Paradise. And then there's also what's referred to as Gehenna, also called hell. 
If you'll remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus back over in Luke chapter 16, Jesus very clearly describes those two pieces. In that story, the rich man, he opens up his eyes, it tells us in the text, in Hades, in a place of torment. And he looks over and he sees Lazarus, that old beggar man, and he says, would you allow him to come and to dip his finger in water and put it on my tongue? Because he says, I'm tormented in these flames. And in the same text, it says he cannot do it because there was a great chasm that was in between the two that the one could not go to the other side or vice versa. You see those two components in that parable. So in your notes, you'll notice that I have a very simplistic, I guess, outline or overview of what that looks like. It's one place, it's called Hades in the New Testament, Sheol, Old Testament, and it's divided into two compartments. There's Abraham's bosom, also called paradise. It's a place of blessing. And on the other side, it is Gehenna, called hell, a place of torment. So according to Acts chapter 2, Ephesians 4, and Psalm 68, Jesus was in Hades. According to Jesus' own words to the thief on the cross, he was in paradise. He was not in hell. So what is he doing in Hades to begin with? That's where 1 Peter chapter 3 answers the question. It tells us in verses 18 through 20, For Christ also died for the sins once for all, and the just for the unjust so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh and made alive in the spirit. Now listen to this. In which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark. Now here's what this is not saying. It is not saying that those who were disobedient back in the time of the ark are now somehow given a second chance. In fact, the word that is used right here is the word preach. It is caruso. It is to proclaim. It is not euangeliso, which means to evangelize. So on the cross, the very last word that Jesus ever uttered was to telestai. It is finished. It's a proclamation of victory. Now in 1 Peter chapter 3, it tells us that Jesus has descended to Hades and he is giving proclamation. What's he proclaiming? He's proclaiming his victory over sin, over death, over hell, over Satan, and over his demons. He is proclaiming victory in that moment to those held captive. Now let's add one more piece in. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. It says, when he, speaking of Jesus ascended on high. He led captive a host of captives. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean? Except he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth. So the apostle Paul is quoting from Psalm 68, which was a victory hymn composed by King David. Whenever a king would win a major battle, a major war, They would not only have a parade where they had the spoils of war, but they would also bring back in that a number of prisoners that were taken. But listen to this. In the parade, the king would make sure that he would have a group of reclaimed prisoners that he's now rescued from the enemy's camp. In other words, it was those who had been taken prisoner along the path of war. It was the king's own people. He would now bring them with him, and those individuals were referred to as recaptured captives. They're given now an opportunity to come back with their king for his purposes. Now combine all of those pieces together. Until Jesus died on the cross, the penalty of sin had not yet been paid. For those Old Testament saints who had placed faith in the promises of God for the future, but they died prior to Jesus' sacrifice, those Old Testament saints had been enjoying the pleasures of God in paradise. In some ways, you could say that their salvation was on credit. The price had not been paid, but the promise was absolutely secure. But when the price of sin had now been paid on the cross, 
Jesus emptied paradise and he led the recaptured captives with him to heaven. Now when a believer dies, they do not go to Abraham's bosom. They do not go to that place of paradise. Now they go with him to heaven. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So what happened to the other half of Hades? What about Gehenna? What about hell? There's one that's now been vacated. Those who were the Old Testament saints have now gone with Christ to heaven. What about the other side? There's only one transition that we find in the Bible to describe something happening with hell. It's actually found in the book of Revelation. It's during the judgment of God. I want you to notice the wording. Write these verses down off to the side. Listen to this phrase when it talks about the lake of fire. The first reference is Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, or verse 20, excuse me. It says, and the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet. It says, and these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. Okay, you have the beast and the false prophet. They're thrown into this lake of fire. Then Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. It says, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. It describes this lake of fire is now having the beast, the false prophet, and the devil all have been thrown in where they will be tormented forever. Now here's your last verse, Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. It says, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Gehenna, that place of hell, it will transition in the future. It transitions from a current place of torment to an eternal place of torment. The price of sin is always death. It's always separation from God. For those in this life, those that are hearing the call of God today, those who are hearing this this call, there's an opportunity to repent of your sin by placing faith in Jesus. For that person, there is mercy enough at the cross. There is grace that is found in him. There is forgiveness that is found in Jesus. There is enough in order to save that person's soul to reconcile them to their creator. But listen, if a person continues in their rebellion, They're wanting nothing to do with God, nothing to do with the gospel, nothing to do with salvation. If they continue on that path of rebellion, they will continue in separation for all eternity, and they will suffer the fullness of that rebellion for eternity. From Jesus' perspective, Saturday was a day of proclaiming victory to the rebels. Satan is defeated. And proclaiming victory to the rebels. To the saints, the king has recaptured his people. So what was Saturday like for the 11 remaining disciples? This is where we begin to transition out of not just perspective into preparation. The gospel gives us one clue. Human understanding will give us another clue. So here's the statement in your notes. The disciples rested and processed based on Luke chapter 23 verse 56. Luke tells us and on the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment. Now we understand the basics of Sabbath that is a time that comes out of formalized work and formalized ministry and stressful activity Uh, For six days, somebody was to labor, they were to work, they were to do what was necessary to earn a living. But on that seventh day, they were to rest and reorient themselves back to God. In his book entitled, The Rest of God, Mark Buchanan defines Sabbath in this way. He said, quote, Sabbath is not just a day, but an orientation, a way of seeing and knowing, end of quote. So after six days of doing what's necessary for life and making a living and all the pieces that come along with that, we understand it's easy to get disoriented and it's easy for us to begin to lose sight of the things that are valued by God. So Sabbath is designed as a day to pull back and rest 
and reorient ourselves once again to who God is and what his purposes are. So according to what we find, they were resting on Sabbath according to the commandment. In other words, they would have been physically resting. There was a part of this that was physical rest. But there's also another part of this that was spiritual realignment. They're reorienting themselves to God as well as to his will. That part we can see from Scripture. But then there's another part. There's also a mental and emotional component that simply comes with death. If you have ever experienced the death of a loved one, you know that the next couple of days bring all sorts of thoughts and emotions. You process grief. It doesn't matter whether or not somebody has had a terminal illness and you saw it coming for months, if not years. There's something different that happens when the person passes away. Mentally, the thought, they're no longer here. What will life look like right now? You replay great memories you, you process things like, did I say everything I needed to say? Did I do everything I needed to do? Many times those last few conversations and last few moments together, those are pieces that are replaying in that person's mind again and again as they're just processing, how do I move forward from here? That's, that's a part of the human condition. That's a part of death. It's, it's what happens when people are just seeing the death of a loved one. So we understand from the disciples' perspective, a part of Sabbath was reorienting themselves to God and resting physically. But a part of the human condition would be they're thinking about Jesus. They're thinking about the stories. They're, they're processing, what do we do from here? And the reason we know that this is a part of it is because Jesus actually prepared them for those conversations before he died on the cross. We're going to go back into the upper room for just a moment because now we have a context to help us understand what the disciples were processing through. You'll understand that there's a number of conversations that Jesus had privately with his disciples and so much of these conversations focused on fear, on death, and preparing them for the next stage of the journey. In your notes, it talks about the fact that Jesus comforted the disciples. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. So for just a moment, go back in your mind to the upper room. Jesus was celebrating Passover with the disciples. He just told them, one of you is going to betray me. That's found in John 13, verse 21. Did you know in that exact same conversation, he told them he was going to die? He tells them, I am with you for a little while longer. You will seek me, but where I am going, you cannot come. There's two major pieces that come out in that one dialogue. That is, there's a traitor amongst us, and Jesus is going away. The first comment was sure to incite anger. The second comment was sure to instill fear. Jesus actually addressed both of those in his comments. He gave them a new commandment in John chapter 13, verse 34. And it wasn't until studying this text that I saw the context again here. Right after he says, one of you is going to betray me, then he says, I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. In other words, the mission of Christ it's too big to let anger or hatred or bitterness or division get in the way of that. Right now is a time you need to learn how to love each other. Yes, there's a traitor, but I got a commandment for you. Love each other as I have loved you. But then he spoke to their fear. He said, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. It's in this context he told him he's going away. But he says, I'm going away to prepare so that we can all be together again. Okay, so hold that thought. Jesus finishes with this statement, you know the way I'm going. And that's when Thomas speaks up. 
And he says, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Now, the issue is Thomas had not been paying attention. For that matter, the other disciples had not been paying attention. Do you know all the way back over in John chapter 7, verse 33, Jesus said, yet a little while I'm with you, and then I go to him who sent me. In other words, he told him, I'm going back to the Father. It's only a little while longer, and I'm going to be back with the Father. But then, all along the way, he was preparing them for what was coming in Jerusalem. He says, when we get to Jerusalem, I'm going to be tried. I'm going to be condemned. I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be spit upon. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die. In other words, I'm going to the Father, and the way I'm going is going to lead me right through trials and right through beatings and right through the cross and right through death. Jesus' path to the Father came through the cross. And Thomas said, Lord, how can we know the way? And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes where? To the Father. You want to go to the Father? No one comes to the Father but by me. When Thomas asked the question, how would we know the way? Jesus says, I am the way. This is so beautiful. Jesus' path to the Father led through the cross. Our path to the Father leads through Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's a great statement, great truth for us to this very day, but it had a different meaning to those who were listening to it, the Jewish audience, back 2,000 years ago. The reason is because in that one phrase, Jesus took three great concepts of Jewish religion and showed how all three found their fulfillment in him. The Jewish people emphasized walking in the ways of God. Deuteronomy 5, Isaiah 30, Psalm 27, and Jesus said, I'm the way. The Jewish people emphasized the importance of truth. Psalm 60 or 86, Psalm 119, Jesus says, I am the truth. Others might speak truth, I am truth. And the Jewish people emphasized the pursuit of life. Proverbs 6, Proverbs 10, Psalm 16. Jesus says, I am the life. One statement, he declares himself to be the way to heaven, the truth we need, and the life we want. And it's all found in Jesus. How is it even possible? Because Jesus is God. And according to Colossians 2, we are complete in him. The day before, the day before, he died on the cross. He's in the upper room, and he's preparing his disciples for Saturday. He's telling them, there's a truth you're going to need to know. You're going to have to love each other the same way I've loved you. He said, there's another truth you need to remember. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Now, the issue is, it's one thing to hear the truth. It's another thing to apply the truth. So that's the next step. He leads them through. He's still preparing them. Jesus taught on the role of the Holy Spirit right after that. John chapter 14, verses 16 through 31. Jesus told this group of frightened, confused disciples that he would ask the Father, and the Father would send another helper. And a couple verses later, he tells us who the helper is. The helper is the Holy Spirit to ease their minds about the fact that they're going to be separated for a period of time. He's, he's saying, don't worry. <laughs> don't be afraid. He says, I'm going to ask the Father. He's going to send a helper, and this helper will not only be with you, he will also be in you. Now, about this moment in my study, it was where the light came on in a whole different way. I'm typing out just insights. Lord, what were you teaching them in the upper room? What was happening the day before? I'm typing these things out. And this thought came to my mind. You're still missing the big story. Look at the whole story. I started thinking, back when Jesus called the disciples to himself, it was about three and a half years to get to this point. For three and a half years, Jesus prepared those disciples. He showed them ministry. He modeled intimacy. He taught them the truths about the kingdom of God. 
For three and a half years, he prepared them to believe God for big things in the midst of uncertainty. And he took them in moment after moment of uncertain circumstances. And he did the miraculous. And he raised the dead. And he healed the sick. And he fed the masses. For three and a half years, he prepared them by telling them, I'm going to die. But at the same time, he reminded them of this saying, you need to know it's coming He prepared them by telling them there's a traitor who is in the midst, but you need to learn how to love each other. He's prepared them by describing the ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit. He will not only be with you, he will also be in you. He prepared them for the fear they're going to face by saying, do not let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And in John chapter 14, verse 29, he's bringing it all together. He says, I have told you I was going away and I will come to you. Now I told you before it happens. So that when it happens, you may believe. And that's when it hit me. Jesus is constantly preparing his followers. But when the big stuff hits, our eyes focus on the immediate circumstances. And we can forget all the preparation that he's been doing in our life in the past. In reflection, we can see the people God put in our life for that exact moment. We can remember the conversations we had to frame that exact moment. We recognize the resources he gave in advance to tide us over for that exact moment. There's passages that come back to mind that help minister to our heart in that exact moment. We understand the sermons he gave us in advance to prepare us for that moment. The prayers he answered to this point in in order to get us through this moment. And when we look back, we can see that God has been preparing us for the Saturdays of life. What are the Saturdays of life? Here it is. Figuratively speaking, Saturdays are when all hope is gone, when life makes no sense, when God seems silent, when our dreams are crushed, when our friends are gone, when our resources are out, when our failures seem final, when our hearts are overwhelmed with fear and regret and confusion. It's in the Saturdays of life that we stand helpless and broken before our God. And that's the moment we need to remember Saturday living principles. Here it is. God prepared us before it happened. So that when it happens, we may believe. He prepared us in advance. God's preparation in our past is what gives us perspective in the moment. Left to ourselves, circumstances can be so difficult we don't even know where to process them. We need God to illumine our minds through his spirit and by his word. Remind us of how he has prepared us in order to give us the perspective we need to go forward. Perspective is essential. How essential is it? Think of it like this. Perspective helps lift our eyes from the hopelessness of a sealed tomb and reminds us that what we see as a sealed tomb, God sees as a fulfilled promise. That's perspective. That's what we need in the moment. As bad as Saturdays can hurt, please remember, God has prepared you. That is the theme of Saturday. God has prepared you. He prepared his disciples. He's preparing us. If you are a born-again child of God, he has prepared you to walk through the Saturdays of life. You say, Paul, I don't feel prepared. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't even know what to believe. All I can tell you is there was another group who came 2,000 years ago that they had a lot of the same concerns. They didn't know what the next step was going to be, and Jesus' statement to them is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way. Follow him. He is the truth. Believe him. He is the life. Listen, you're complete in him. Our job is to pursue him. Let's say you find yourself in a difficult spot 
and you can't remember those three pieces. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You're like, I don't know what to do. Let me tell you, always go with the guy who got up from the dead. If you can't remember anything else, remember that. Go with the one who got up from the dead. He's worthy. He is sufficient. He is enough. He has prepared us. He will walk us through. Pursue Jesus with all of your life. There might be people who are in the room right now that you do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior. I beg you today, consider the claims of Jesus. What would hold you back from placing faith in him as Lord and Savior? There's people in the room right now that are believers. They're they're not wrestling with, am I a Christian? But I'll tell you what they are wrestling with. They find themselves in a place of uncertainty. And they've been trying to hold on to everything and everyone other than Jesus in this moment. And they're trying to put Jesus off on the side and say, yes, I know he's important, but I still need this. No, he's it. And when you pursue him, he provides the other pieces that we need. I don't know what you might be walking through personally, but I cannot encourage you enough. Pursue Jesus. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. He has prepared us before it happened so that when it happens, we may believe. If you would, bow with me for prayer for just a moment. Heads bowed, eyes closed. There might be people in the room right now that you have never placed faith in Jesus. Let me, let me as quickly as I can and as simply as I can, let me tell you the good news of Jesus Christ. And it is good news. The fact that you are in this room today, that there's breath in your body, that there's opportunity in your life, that's good news. Here's the good news of Jesus Christ. Humanity was created for relationship with God. Our sin separated us from that relationship. There was nothing that any of us could do to make things right. You might think to yourself right now, I've messed up so bad, God can never do anything with me. God would never want me. All I can say is we've all messed up. If we got what we deserved, it would be an eternity separated from God in hell. According to Scripture, we were created for a relationship Our sin separated us from that relationship. There was nothing we could do to reconcile it ourselves, but Jesus did for us what we could not do. He lived a sinless life. He died a substitutionary death on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. And as we're going to get into in two weeks, he rose from the dead three days later that we might experience life. He offers eternal life, a reconciled relationship to those who repent of their sin by placing faith in Jesus Christ. That's the good news. If there's anything inside of you right now that sees that as appealing, that you want that, that you, there's something saying he's talking to you, whatever that might be, I encourage you, do not ignore the small voice of the Spirit of God. Place faith in Jesus today. In just a few moments, there's going to be pastors and some of our pastor's wives at the front. There's going to be counselors at the front. There's people right now, you just need to pray with somebody. You're going through an extended Saturday right now. It's been, it's been months, maybe even years that you've been walking through uncertainty, and you just need somebody to pray with you. There's people here willing to pray with you. There might be people today that you're saying, I don't need somebody to pray with me, but there's something I got to release this morning at the altar. Something in my life has to die so that I can continue to walk with him. Whatever that might be, we're going to have a word of prayer. There'll be a song of invitation. And then it's going to be open for you to respond as the Spirit of God leads you. Heavenly Father, we need you, Lord. We recognize without you we can do nothing. With you all things are possible. So, Lord, at this time, we pray that your spirit would clearly guide as to how we need to respond. Lord, it has to be you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing this final song. The altar is open for however the spirit of God is leading you.